Good evening and welcome, beloved, to Wednesday night Bible study here at Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, today is July. What day is it? July the 29th. And we are right in the middle of a wonderful hot summer. We've had the temperatures in the 90s, 91, 92, 93, almost all week. We've had rain in the evenings and thunderstorms. And so summer is upon us. And so you might have no, noticed that I have my uh, summer uh, pattern shirt on, my vacation shirt, because it's summertime. And normally many of us would be traveling and going to uh, varying places. But this summer we're here because of the coronavirus. But you know what? It's no reason we can't have a mental vacation. There's no reason we can't use our imagination. And so I thought I'd put on my vacation shirt today because I love the summer and I love this time of season. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, what are we going to do for the rest of the summer? Normally, we would take a break if we're in person. But guess what? We're not going to take a break this year. We're going to do every night in August as well. I'm going to shrink the time a little bit down and be a little more relaxed if it's all right with you. And so we will continue through our study through the month of August. And so let me just encourage you to get a happy feeling in your mind and a happy feeling in your heart. And uh, although I know you're dealing with a lot, don't let the summer go by without enjoying it. Find some things that you can do to enjoy the summer and enjoy each day. Uh, a life that's worth living is a life that has fulfillment. Well, guess what? Today we're in the 12th chapter of Acts as we continue in our study. And I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, matter of fact, uh, tell you what, type in what's your favorite summer vacation? What's your favorite summer vacation? Well, mine very simply is going to the Caribbean and going on one of those beautiful white sand beaches and that crystal blue water. To me, it doesn't get any better than that. Last year, my wife and I, we were on a little boat out there in the Caribbean and we had a wonderful time. So I can't look back to that. Well, that's my favorite one. It, tell you what, is that for you, what's your favorite vacation that you went on? Just go ahead and type it in and share it with the Bible class tonight. All right, we're in Acts. We're in Acts chapter 12. And while you're typing those vacations in there and sharing and commenting, uh, we're going to turn to Acts 12, chapter 12, verse number 1. All right, let's go on and begin. About the time... About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And this was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And so now as we uh, approach now this 12th chapter, our author does a wonderful job, a skillful job, a master, almost like an artist <clears throat> in terms of contrasting the great love that was experienced in chapter 11 from the church of Antioch and the saints of Jerusalem for the saints of Jerusalem with the cold-hearted enmity of Herod and the Jews for the church. So in chapter 11, we saw the church growing. We saw the church in Antioch where they were first called Christians. And we saw how they took up um, gifts and they took up resources to be a blessing to the saints of Jerusalem in a time of famine. And so it's a warm time for the church. And right behind it in chapter 12, what we see is that the church also is facing very difficult times and it's facing very difficult times under the rule of Herod and uh, the Jews for the church. 
So here Herod is mentioned. Herod is mentioned here. Herod uh, mentioned here is Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I. Now this is not Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great was in the days of Jesus. This is Herod Agrippa the first, and he's the grandson of Herod the Great. He had inherited most of the territory um, that um, was previously ruled over. And so now his reign, it wasn't very long, uh, but it would be Herod Agrippa the second that would be dealing with Paul later on in Acts. Well, here we have Herod uh, Agrippa the uh, first, a, a ruler who was popular with the Jew, Jews, and he found that he could use the Christian community to his advantage, not only religious-wise, but also politically. And so what he does is he comes to understand that he could curry favor with the Jewish community by persecuting the Christians. And so he had the Christians arrested, and he had James, we're told, the brother of John, executed. And when he had him executed, he saw how much the Jewish community was excited about this. Now remember, the first Christians were Jews, but now the church is growing on past that initial smaller community, and now they're growing into the non-Jewish community, the Gentile community, and the spirit is growing and it's calling more people into the context of church or ecclesia. And so now what he does, having seen that he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he opposed, he proposed to arrest Peter also. And by Jews here, he means any who are counter to the Christian or any who were counter to Jesus's movement. We're told it was the, during the time of the unleavened bread and he seizes him, he puts him in prison and he delivers him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending at Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And so uh, it was his intention and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. This is the seven day spring feast that immediately followed after the Passover. And so the Passover here refers to the combination of the eight day feast, the Passover itself, followed by the seven days of unleavened bread and Herod saw this as a great opportunity to win favor, and Peter would be the perfect uh, instrument for that. First, Peter was known as a leader in the church, and secondly, Peter had just come from fraternizing, eating, breaking bread with the Gentiles, which of course the Jews were definitely against. And so Herod made certain plans. He imprisoned Peter. We're told he was secure. He had him secured and handed over by guards, by, to a guard, by four squads of four soldiers each. Now, first of all, for Rome, prison was not seen as punishment. It was simply seen as a holding place. As a matter of fact, you were placed in prison and you were just held there for one of two results. One, you were either going to be brought out for a trial or two, you were going to be killed, perhaps even crucified. And so prison for them was a little different than us. In our society, uh, we use prison predominantly as a way of punishment. And that whole punishment versus rehabilitation, that's another conversation for another time. But for the Jewish, for the Roman community, they were simply holding cells and had um, horrendous conditions, uh, basically almost think about a uh, pit, a dirt floor, uh, darkness just locked away, and you just stayed there and you waited for your trial 
or you waited for execution. And so most Romans saw prison as kind of a pre-death because if you got in prison, there was much, not much uh, chance of you coming off out of that or coming away from that. And so here, Peter is not only in prison, but now he has been handed over to four squads of four soldiers each. Meaning this, meaning that there were two soldiers who were literally physically chained to him. Okay? And on the out, on, on each side, and two standing guard outside. So that's four. And they probably worked six hour shifts, and then the next four would come on. So he would have two soldiers chained to him, and also two guarding the door. Now you say, why would Herod go to such extremes for somebody who, like Peter, who is a former fisherman, who's now become a preacher? But you do recall that in Acts 5, verses 19 through 24, that Peter had been in prison before, and that Peter had been locked up, and that an angel came, and that Peter again had been released or led from prison. So now, uh, I'm thinking Herod is aware of this, and Herod is thinking he's not going to get out of this prison. We're going to keep him locked up. So Peter, it says, was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now contrast this, that Peter was bound, but the church was still praying. Peter is the leader of the church, or one of the leaders of the church. He's bound, but the church is still loose. Peter is shackled, the church is still free. What do I mean by that? He's shackled physically, but the church is free because what does the church do? The church prays. And some people may not understand the full power and implication of prayer and what it means, but the writer is clear that there is liberty in the act of praying and there is liberty in the act of being able to pray. So the church was praying for Peter. Interestingly enough, in verse 6, it says, Peter, um, it's the night before the trial, and Peter is sound asleep. Let's see how that reads. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and uh, centuries before the door were guarding the prison. So Peter's trust in God was so great that he was not up all night, but he literally is trusting God. And Peter, I, I think it's fair to say, is saying whatever his fate is, he realizes he's in the hand of God. He's not in control of this. God is in control of this. And so he's sound asleep. And then we're told uh, this is the night before the trial. Now, thank God I've never had to go to court and to be on trial, but I can't imagine that would be one of the most nerve-wracking experiences that a person can go through, to be going to a courtroom and to think that somebody else has in their power and in their decision-making what will happen to you in the outcome going forward. So that is tremendously, to me, a time would be very difficult to sleep, but not for Peter, because Peter knew that he was trusting in God. All right. He didn't fear for his life. If you look in John 21, John 21, verse 18, listen to this scripture. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to be to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And so this is what Jesus had told Peter earlier. So perhaps Peter was saying, you know what? I'm not going to die in here. Jesus had told me that 
I'm young, but when I'm old. And so maybe he was at the place where he was totally trusting that. And he realized, I'm going to go get a chance to grow older here. Well, in verse 7, in verse 8, let's look at that real quick. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. He did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but through, though, but thought he was seeing a vision. When he had passed the first and the second guard, then came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them for its own, for its own accord, and they went out and immediately along one street, and immediately the angel left him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord hath sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And so now we're told, Second time, an angel has helped Peter escape. Recall in Acts 5, 17 through 20, I mentioned earlier, awaking Peter, the angel told Peter to get dressed and follow him out of the prison. Now, of course, this would be what we would call a supernatural experience outside the natural order. God causes the chains to fall from his wrist. And in the midst of this, the guards who he, were tra who he was trained to are still asleep. So I want you to kind of get this. An angel comes in and basically slaps Peter, wakes him up. He wakes up. The angel says, follow him out of the prison. He gets up, the chains are free off his wrist. And in the midst of all of this, the guards are still sleeping and the iron gate opens. Wow. One of the sub themes of Acts is the outreach of the gospel in spite of opposition. Peter in prison, Peter chained to two soldiers, Peter behind iron bars with two other soldiers on the other side, and yet they cannot contain him. It is saying you cannot contain the gospel. You cannot contain the movement of God. It almost is a wonderful imagery of resurrection, of Jesus and the imagery of grave and death. And you've heard it said many times. I've preached many sermons and quoted that text. Death cannot hold you. All right, death cannot keep you. All right, just passing through. And so the sub-theme here of Acts is that the gospel will and must continue even by supernatural means, God has ordained it, that it will continue to go and no king, no Herod, no guards, no prison can stop it. And so we see Peter's release. We're told that after going through all this, the angel leads him past the second guard. They came to the iron gate leading to the city. The iron gate opened for them on its own accord. And they went out and went along one of the streets. And it says, then, only then, the angel left him. 
And when Peter came to himself, when Peter became aware, in other words, he realizes this is not a dream. This is what I'm experiencing. He says, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And so Peter came to himself. He embraces his freedom. He embraces the reality that God has moved again. He acknowledges that God is a God of deliverance, that God had delivered him physically from Herod's prison. And God had delivered him physically from the chains that shackled him. And notice, important, and from the expectation of the Jews and what would happen, what would mean certain death. Now he realizes this was no vision. Verse number nine, and he went out and followed him. He did not know that he was being done. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. That's verse number nine. And now when he gets to verse number 11, he realizes that he has been rescued. Now, one of the great themes of the Bible, of course, is God's deliverance. God is a deliverer. You've heard me teach in the past on this. The first great theme of the Bible is that God is a creator. All the way back to Genesis, what we see God do is God creates. So when somebody says, what's God like? God is a creator. All right. And so that's what God does, not only in the universe, that's what God does in our lives. God gives us the gifts, the ability, the skills to be great creators. All right. But also the second great theme of the Bible in the, New, in the Old Testament is deliverance, that God is a deliverer. And that it's amplified, of course, in the story of Joseph and the story of Egyptian slavery and the story of Moses and the deliverance that God provides. That great theme is now echoed in Acts that God delivers God's people. So beloved, so beloved, listen to me. Know that God is, has been, will be a deliverer. And so if there's anything in your life that you're struggling with, God is a great deliverer. If there are situations, habits, relationships, um, health, finances, whatever it may be, God is a great deliverer. Let me encourage you to seek God. Let me encourage you to trust God, to develop that kind of faith that allows you to sleep in the midst of a prison, chained to two soldiers with two soldiers out front. That's what faith says. Faith says that God has my life. My life is in God's hands and nothing is going to happen to me. It says that he has numbered the hair upon my head. Not even a sparrow falls to the earth without his knowledge, the smallest of birds. And so that's what we're doing every week, every day. We're growing in our faith and we're believing and trusting God for God's best. We're believing and trusting God that God has an extraordinary, extraordinary blessing in this life, not simply when we die, but yet while we're living. And many of us are living those blessings every single day and we're getting better. God's getting better and God is opening up more to us. I'm discovering every day of my life that the more I can open myself up and become more sensitive to the movement of God. I'm seeing opportunities all around me. I'm seeing God's blessings all around me. It's not that they weren't there before. It's not that it's there, but all things in God's time, all things in God's time. So be patient, beloved. I know it's the summertime. The temptation is to kind of just park yourself and just totally 
uh, just kind of veg out. But go ahead and write your goals down. Go ahead and prep for the fall. Go ahead and seek God for a greater blessing. Go ahead and believe that God is going to add to your life, that it's going to get better. Don't get caught up in all the consuming talking about negative, negative, negative. Trade some of those negative people for some positive people. Get around some people who are going to speak into your life in a positive way. Get around some people who've got a lifting of spirit. Don't hang around people always just pulling you down. All they got is bad news. If I say, if you got any news, it's always bad news. Get around some people who are going to lift you up and encourage you. It's the summer months. I want you to do some things in the summer that will be a blessing to you and to your family. Be creative. Play some board games. Be creative. Uh, engage with each other. Uh, be creative. You can't do what you normally do, but you can be creative. Uh, think about some things that you you can do and to help solidify those relationships that are so very important to you. Well, listen, I'm going to wrap it up now. I told you I'm not going to be as long. We're going to cut it back just a little bit in the summer. We're going to stop right there and we'll be right back uh, this time next week. And we're going to pick up from here and see what happens because the church was praying and the church's prayer is answered because Peter has been set free. And just as Peter has been set free, you and I have been set free in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, beloved, thank you for joining us today. There's a lifting in my spirit. I pray there's a lifting in your spirit, and I'm praying for you today. And uh, as we close out today, I want you to just take a moment and just thank God for the deliverance in your life, the deliverance in your life. Where has God brought you through? What has God brought you from? Uh, somebody type that in deliverance, deliverance. And I'm going to pray for deliverance tonight, that if anybody is chained, if anybody is shackled, and if you've been delivered, go on and encourage somebody. Just type it in. Just type, I've been delivered. Just say, I've been delivered. I've been released. I've been uh, uh, blessed. I've been elevated. Uh, be a witness. Encourage people while we're teaching. Because you never know how your words can make a difference for somebody and how your life can reach somebody else. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the magnificence of God's word. It is such a great anchor for us. It's a lifting of our souls. And we thank you that even in the midst of when we were seeing the church being blessed and opposition arises, but in the midst of that opposition, we see God's faithfulness and we see that God is a deliverer. And even when others may be posed against us, like Herod was against Peter, it doesn't mean that they have the power over our lives. Our lives belong to our Creator. And so we just bless, bless, bless all right now who are in need of prayer, all who stand, God, right now in greater need. We just ask ministering angels, as God sent an angel to that prison, we pray ministering angels would go into homes right now and deliver and provide what is needed and guidance and freedom. We thank you, we thank you in the name of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus. We give all glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, beloved, and thank you for sharing with us. What a wonderful time. Oh, by the way, hey, give me a quick comment on the shirt. Do you like the shirt? What do you think? Give me a quick comment on the shirt. I'm, 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 I'm on mental vacation, but I'm enjoying every day. Be blessed, and remember, write in your best vacation. What was your best vacation? Just type it in. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, and have a great day.